You've seen them go down the street, they're big, they're shiny, most of the time you're trying to get somewhere and they're in your way, but they get the right of way. What are they? How do they work? What's inside of them? I'm here with the chief talking about an ambulance. Chief, we have an ambulance here. Yes, we do. This is our brand new 2015 Ford four-wheel drive ambulance. Uh, this ambulance, uh, as you'll see later, has uh, many op options in the back for saving lives. And uh, we go out on probably about uh, 3,000 runs a year on this uh, uh, ambulances in uh, New Lenox. So it's a pretty busy piece of equipment. One thing I did notice about this compared to everything else was it has a license plate. Yes, most emergency vehicles do not have license plates. Fire engines do not have license plates. Um, our ladder truck doesn't have a license plate, but ambulances are required to have license plates. And there's many reasons for this. Well, one of the reasons is it starts with the seven. We are part of the Region 7 medical system. Uh, there's a Region 8, which is Chicago. We're Region 7. The state is split up in different regions. Are the regions what? based on counties or hospitals? No, they're not based on counties. So uh, in our region, uh, there's many different hospitals. Uh, uh, there's uh, uh, Kankakee, Chicago Heights, Morris, Joliet hospitals. So it's a huge area. Okay. 122 designates that this is New Lenox's ambulance. Okay. So 7122 would say it's Region 7 New Lenox, and then the 04 is this is number four out of our four ambulances. Okay. So, so they number them that way. Uh, the other reason we have a license plate is because Medicare, Medicaid billing has to be attached to a license plate. So we have to give them that plate number so that they can charge appropriately what the uh, fees are for that particular incident. Okay. okay well, let's go back inside and go back in the back and see what we have inside. We're now in the back of an ambulance. Luckily, I've never been in the back of an ambulance. So a lot of the questions I'm going to ask are probably going to be very basic questions. And most people, when they're in the back of the ambulance, I doubt if they're asking about the structure, or how the gurney works and things like that. So please bear with us. Chief, we are with... Firefighter Bandic. You've been an ambulance driver for... Uh, I've been a paramedic for almost three years. Now, do you normally drive or are you normally back here? Um, it switches every shift. So okay. we have... Um... We have my dedicated partner. We go back and forth every shift. So. Okay. How many uh, people are normally in an ambulance? Just two, usually. Um, but we always do, uh, there's certain calls where we have our truck follow us or an engine company follow us. And on the extremely serious calls, we have our battalion chief come with us as well. Okay. So we could have up to five people. Okay. And starting with the basic, what is special or what is the gurney we all look at the old movies where it was just a clip type sure this looks a lot more complicated sure this allows us to um to go down to the patient's level bring him back up um it's easy on our back um when we get it into the ambulance um basically we put it in and we can lift it up so okay. we do not need to put a lot of stress on our backs um it's this a power cot a power cot so okay works. this so. works position of comfort for the patient okay uh, up and down and that's pretty much it you can do you can use two people on this to lift it or if you're only by yourself you can actually raise it just one man okay now th this cot here uh, can handle up to 750 pound person wow uh, we just had our bariatric unit which is out of station two uh, which is the same cot but it also has a power loading system on it and uh, we just had someone that was about 500 pounds on that one these cots here, uh, this is very similar to that cot over there. This cot here runs about $20,000. For the cot? Yes. Wow. Now, again, 500 pound person, you two couldn't pick it up, pick him up or her up. No, sir. It, it's, it has a, a lift that actually pulls it on? No, uh, the bariatric unit has a lift that pulls it into the ambulance, but both of these cots have power to where they can raise the person so the actual paramedics aren't lifting them straight up. Oh, okay. Uh, the, there's a power uh, motor underneath that will actually raise the cot up and lower the cot down safely. So when you push it out, the, it goes, the wheels go down by yes. themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, how does this thing stay secure? I mean, you're in a moving vehicle. Sure. There's a lock um, right here. Um, okay. We put this in. There is a stabilizer in the back here, and then there's a lock here. So we got to slide it in, and then it actually locks in until we disengage it. Okay. Okay. So, so there's, you don't have to strap it down or anything. 
No, nope, it's just a roll in, and you'll hear the click, and that's it. No, as a, as a, as a person, the driver in the front, what do you call the person in the back? The paramedic. The paramedic in the back, how is he secured to make sure that, because well, I'm sure you have to keep moving. Um, yes, at most, um, for our more basic calls, we're always strapped in here. Okay. Um, if we have to be doing CPR or consistently checking vitals, we usually have maybe two guys in the back, which where your one guy is secured, and then you have one guy doing CPR, checking vitals, as well as trying to be secured the best they can during transport. Yeah, yeah. And I look around and there's, there's, I was surprised how much room is actually back here. Yeah. And that from the outside, they don't look this big inside. I see everything's padded, so you don't wall up your head on yeah, things, it, which it, I would do all the time. <laughs> it does happen occasionally, but. But you all the containers. What are what are what is most of the in the packs? You have towels. You have. Uh, Hot and cold pads. Sure. So up up here, um, we just have our blankets and our sheets. This is more our trauma compartment. So anything um, with a car accident or you know, um, when well, wounds fall out of a tree. Sure. Yeah. Break your arm. We're gonna put our trauma dressings together for them. More bleeding control. Okay. Um, here we have our oxygen. So we're gonna put our mask on or a nasal cannula. Okay. Um, here we have our airway compartment which would be uh, we have nasal airways we have our et tubes our et tubes are for serious calls when we actually have to intubate the patient and breathe for them now does that go through the nose or the mouth this or? will go through your the your, mouth. your your mouth okay. into, the, into the throat essentially okay so you can actually intubate someone in here absolutely yes. and it happens more than you would think really mm -hmm. and then you have a Big monitor there yes, sir. and there. So this is our heart monitor. Um, our heart monitor can do many things. It can cardiovert a patient. Cardiovert? We're gonna be shocking the patient, okay. basically. We're gonna be defibrillating the patient. If their okay. heart is quivering, we can try to get it out of that rhythm and bring it back to a normal rhythm. Um, it also tells us what exactly is going on with their heart. So many different rhythms that we all train for and the rhythm isn't gonna lie, it's gonna tell us exactly what's going on with you. Very, you'll see signs and symptoms, you'll see breathing, sweating, you know, it all coincides with the heart. Okay. Um, this will also take an automatic blood pressure. This will tell us our oxygen in our blood. Okay. It's a pulse oximeter. <clears throat> and that's about it for that. And that, that unit there runs about $26,000 for that one piece of equipment. Uh, we Just were, for that small monitor? We are lucky. The foundation uh, purchased uh, our AED, some AEDs, and some monitor defibrillators, which is what that is, for us. And they also purchased and helped us purchase this cot and helped us purchase the cot at the other station also. So the foundation has helped us dramatically with purchasing some of these high cost items that uh, are a little outside of our budget. So when you're at the concerts, Remember, split the pots, and when you're out on the streets, when you see the boots, make sure you give to the boots. So remember that when you're at the concert. The foundation does wonderful things, and it's one thing that should be donated too heavily. And, and another item I want to mention with the defibrillator, and, I, and it upsets me when I watch TV shows. I can't watch medical shows because it shows them with the straight flat line, yes. and it shows them shocking someone. We don't shock flat line. We have to have some heart rhythm. So if the heart is quivering, as he mentioned earlier, when you shock it, it actually does stop the heart. The, the, the defibrillation stops the heart Okay. when we defibrillate it. And then the normal pulse or the normal uh, uh, pacemaker of the heart will take over and then run that heart. Okay. Uh, if there's no activity in the heart whatsoever, shocking it doesn't bring it back. Oh. That we have to do some other kind of uh, uh, therapy to get that to go. but. This is to stop the heart, actually, which a lot of people don't realize. Well, you know, TV never lies, like the no, internet. No, I know. <laughs> and what's that one for? <laughs> this here has all our basic controls for the actual box of the ambulance. That'll be like our lights. That will be our oxygen to turn it on and off for the patient. Okay. Um, this will control the temperature of the ambulance, and as well as our um, our suction. So okay. as, as long as if there's some clog yeah. somewhere in a patient's airway, we can suction something out of them. Okay. Um, so that basically controls everything in the back. 
This here is our thermometer, just our oral thermometer. Yeah. We take on every patient. Um, you have a radio? Our radio that will communicate. There's a couple teen of uh, channels on there. Okay. Which will get us to, will let us transmit to whoever we need to transmit. I notice you have a, a, a number for poison control. Sure. Is that an issue that often? Um, yeah, I mean, for, for younger children or even older um, elderly, you know, they maybe take too much of their medication or too much cough syrup or, you know, it's it's all, it all changes. Yeah, so. yeah. Interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. Anything else in here that's really neat that I may have missed? Because it's just, to a point, it's, it's kind of overwhelming. I mean, it must be countless hours just to learn all this. It is. And that's... Um, Oh yeah, we we a do have a, a child seat as well. Oh, so if if you're transporting a, a mother mm -hmm. and you have to bring the child, you have a child seat in. Absolutely. That's right in. that's something that I would never have thought of. Yeah, that is that is really interesting. And chief, how much does one of these cost? One of the whole the ambulance. Uh, we just purchased one recently, and we got a really good deal on it for about two hundred thousand dollars. You can spend anywhere from about uh, 200 to about 280 wow. for an ambulance. And again, it's our four wheel drive ambulances, so they can get through the snow during the winter also. No, you're looking at another 20 years on this, or just as technology no, changed too fast? These will probably, I'm hoping to get a good eight years out of this. They run a lot on the streets. Um, so if we can get uh, uh, seven, eight years front line and then start moving it more into a second response, okay. more of a reserve type of vehicle. So. Uh, we do have uh, uh, two new ambulances now. Uh, we're going to have to purchase another one here in the next year or so. Okay. Now, how does the driver talk to the paramedic in the back? In the back? There's a window right here. Um, okay. And the, the window can be opened or closed. Uh, usually, if the, if the driver needs to communicate with dispatch, the window's closed. Okay. If I need to get a hold of him, hey, we need to go faster, slow down a little bit, we're okay. Um, open the window and just communicate with them just like that. So, How many calls do you think you guys do for ambulance a year? Any idea? We're over 3,000 calls this year. That's uh, including, we're about 3,200 actually, with uh, EMS and fire. And EMS is about 85 to 87% of our calls. So you're probably doing eight calls a day. I know when, like I oh, said, easy, yes. when we did the fire truck, the, the ladder truck, we had to come in and we had two calls just in that 15 minutes. Yes. Yes, it, it, we, we get quite a few uh, EMS calls. Uh, it goes up and down during the day, the mornings and the afternoons uh, when you have the rush hour traffic, the people going to and from work, it goes up a little bit. In the evening, it goes up when people are out having a good time relaxing. Um, then there's these people that, uh, um, for whatever reason, they wake up at 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, they're not feeling well. so goes up and down but uh, we can get calls at any time of the day or night um, and you never know some some days are truly really busy and all four ambulances are out going constantly we have four ambulances in our district if our ambulances are out we do call ambulances from other towns we can bring in an ambulance from Frankfurt, Mokina, Manhattan, East Joliet they will come in and assist us uh, but we also go to them to assist when they're running low on yeah. ambulances so we we back up each other and um, it's very common that these ambulances are all going at one time. And I notice outside you have storage on the outside. Now, is that for just the, the paramedics equipment or? There is, we have fire equipment on here. We have our backboards and we have, I mean, extra spare tools. I mean, there's the oxygen mean, there's, bottles out here. Okay. The yeah. oxygen bottles actually back in this compartment here. And there's access to it from the outside. So, and, they, and like we said earlier, the firefighters and the paramedics are all one. So they do carry their gear on here. So if there's a fire, this goes to the fire. And it does for two reasons. The two people in the front we use for helping with the fire. Yes. And we can also use this if anybody is hurt at the fire or if any firefighters get hurt. We have an ambulance on the scene we can transport immediately. We don't have to call for one. Okay. Okay. So I see you guys a lot of times the ambulances at games and things. Now that's a great service to provide, but why are you normally there? Well, at football games, they have to have an ambulance on site. So we provide the ambulance on site at the, the Lincoln Way games, the Providence games. 
uh, but we also supply it in any event that's in the, in the village of New Lenox. Uh, because when you have large groups of people together, there could be problems. Okay. And we want to make sure we're on the scene right away to take care of those problems because it takes extra long time for us to get uh, into an event. No. And if we're already inside that event, it helps. When you have your um, uh, concerts yes. down here, uh, we're on site so we can get to the people much quicker and get them out of there. So it works out very well for us. But when you go to those events, we are actually planning six to eight months ahead of time to get ready for the event. We just don't show up. We start getting ready way beforehand, talking okay. about how we do it. There's things we're supposed to we're, we're supposed to put together called incident action plans, IAPs. So we draw up an incident action plan for each event. This is what we're going to do if the weather goes bad. This is what we're going to do if uh, uh, we have uh, a heat emergency. This is what we're going to do for different things. If we get a bunch of bees there to start stinging people, okay. you have to have plans for it. So we do not just show up and just wing it there's a plan in place for every event. Yeah, and it probably varies from summer to winter. Yes. I mean, what you need in this for winter is probably a little different than what you need in it for summer. Exactly, and when you're planning so far ahead, you don't know if it's gonna be a hot day, a cold day, a rainy day, a stormy day. You have to plan for those. And, and finally, I have to ask you one question. This is shiny clean inside now, but you have trauma kits. So, and you're dealing with sick people. It's gotta be quite messy. How do you clean this? Well, when when the call is over, we have a, we go to the hospital, of course, and we actually sometimes have to hose out the back of the ambulance. Uh, everything is thoroughly disinfected at the ambulance before we go in service again. Okay. So we could be at the hospital for 15 minutes or we can be at the hospital for an hour. Um, it just depends on the nature of the call. Yeah, because I mean, you're dealing with every body fluid probably imaginable at Absolutely. different times. Yes. And with what kind of pathogens and diseases and everything else you're dealing with? Yeah, I mean, there's, we, everything is completely disinfected. We have sprays. We actually have a company come in. Um, I believe it's once a year. At least once At a least year, once sometimes a year. more, depending on what kind of calls we've had. Okay. Um, and they, they are the real professionals. They disinfect absolutely everything. Um, but before our ambulance goes back in service, this thing is disinfected from top to bottom the best we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. You're welcome. You're welcome. I hope we never have to write them. So do I. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe in the back's fine, but that's it, like yeah. this. Yeah. But, but not on that. <laughs> this is pretty good.